America. As the hurricane season is fast approaching, Robbie is trying to get in some fishing before the storms arrive. But first we take to the sky to survey our favorite local hangout spot. Ready. The Riviera Maya is a paradise, but it is at risk of becoming a paradise lost. What can you see? Uh, the new houses, the destruction of the Caleta, that's what I can see. Loss of habitat for the marine and land-based wildlife is very apparent as enthusiastic wealthy people flock out to this area to build large new houses and hotels. The area is a beautiful and hurricane-shielding crevice of what was once largely mangrove forest facing the Caribbean Sea. I always wonder, what do people hope to enjoy here once the mangrove forest is completely bulldozed down, once the algae blooms make it impossible to swim in the ocean water, and every submerged surface is covered in sad brown slime? Fascinatingly, this particular location may have been used as a landing spot for ancient Mayan watercraft. This small stone hut, built between 700 and 500 years ago, was a resting point for either merchants, fishing people, or clergy people. Now it's a personal lawn ornament for these people's backyard. I like to LARP out the vision of what it might have been like to live here many years ago in this amazing little caleta. Robbie hunting around in the shallows, seeing what might be edible in the fish nursery. The sargasso weed overwhelms us. There's so much sargasso. But at the end of the day, we hide out in one of the less affected quarters of the bay to cool off and to enjoy what is left of this amazing spot. We have a ton of these on the boat. When I mean a ton, we literally have, I would say, 700 kilos, and I took a piece that was about that big and smelted it. And you pour the lead into the, into the little slots, and you get four different sizes that come out from the mold and we're really lucky because it's not I don't think it's pure lead I think it's an alloy it's the exact alloy that, that I want which I think it contains about 10% or more of uh, tin in it so the jigs uh, they don't bend they're really strong if you use a pure lead alloy they, they bend and when you paint them, the lacquer cracks on them and water gets in and ruins your, your paint job. So the stiffer they are, the better. How good is it for you to be playing with lead with your bare Not hands? Not so good. <laughs> Robbie connects best with his environment by devising ways to trap and eat creatures. We acquired this handy little furnace to melt down and to recycle some metals in and around our boat. The oven hooks up to our galley's propane tank and melts down our scrap lead in minutes. Did that scare you the first time? 
This cute little oven is nice because we can easily control the amount of airflow to make the metal melt faster or slower. This, this regulates the amount of air that goes in. See? So technically, the more the blue the flame is, the better it's burning. It should almost be invisible, the flame, when it's burning just right. Carefully peering over the top, once we see that the lead is liquid, we can close the valves and remove the floating residue at the top of the crucible. Robbie has two or three minutes to pour the liquid before the lead begins to harden again. The mold remains quite hot, but within about five minutes, he's already able to open it and see the results. Again, Robbie loves playing bare-handed with lead, it seems, but I would not recommend that unless you want to develop lead poisoning. If they're really bad and if you find that they're weak, you can just, just chuck it back down in the lead and... For now, the lures are simply to be painted with hardware store one-part paint. But as I learned with painting the interior of our boat, it's pretty much necessary to use two-parters if you actually want to keep the paint on your surfaces for any period of time. The thing I don't have yet is the, the shiny holographic foil to put on them, to heat shrink on, onto them and then cut it off and put the lacquer. So we're trying bold and non-shiny colors. Not bad for a mock-up or prototypes, however. Also in our recycling endeavor, we wanted to see how our old bent-up stanchions might work for making fishing weights. At this point, we had bought some more safety equipment for pouring the lead, although I'm still working on getting Robbie to wear a respirator for the toxic fumes. However, luckily, we had a good breeze blowing that day. The furnace is made for melting down more than just lead, so it'll be interesting to melt down other metals eventually, too. Once the metal has completely melted down, it's time to turn it off and to scoop off the slag. The tongs that came with the oven are just large enough to grip the crucible, but it's good to have a long pair of pants on and some foot protection, just in case you lose your grip. This first pour, there was a lot of spittering and spattering as he poured into the stanchions, which is another good reason to have that protection for the face and extremities. We would find out in just a moment why there was sputtering. Oh, oh. what happened? What other, what other thing opened up? I have to see what happened. I think something went wrong. So all that liquid lead had just poured out through the openings of the stanchions and pooled at the bottom of the bucket. Robbie would have to secure those aluminum cans around the midsection of the stanchion holes a lot better than with only string. But all we have is this blue painting tape. Hopefully it doesn't immediately burn through. Okay, round two. Start the fire. Start the oven. Place the metal inside. The flame basically invisible in the daylight. Wait several minutes. Stop the oven and then clean off the residue. This time around, there was definitely a lot less sputtering, and the stanchions filled up a lot more quickly, meaning that nothing was seeping out into the rock in the sand. You're sticking out your tongue. We always have some broken tiles or concrete pieces nearby to pour out the excess melted material, so that it doesn't remain in the container. But I don't want to 
end up with only these sides, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shorten two of them as well. Robbie was happy with his final results, using a file to smooth out the edges. I might cut two at so I can make... By drilling this one, we can also make another one. He only noted that the stanchions are pretty large, even as very deep water fishing weights, and could probably be cut down to at least half the size. As for the homemade jigs, they were painted and were being experimented on for how they could be set up. So there is two ways that I tie these jigs. There is a simple, quick, and so not right way, but it works very well. And then there is the proper way to tie your jigs. And uh, I will show you the both ways to do it. You have your triple hooks and you have your assist hooks. This is a particularly big one, but this is an assist hook. This is a triple hook. And the main difference is that the triple hooks increase your chance of getting a hookup, but also increase your chances of getting snagged on a rock and getting snagged on other stuff. And I also find that triple hooks will bend easier and you tend to lose more fish on there for some reason. While your assist hook uh, reduces your chances of snagging on rocks and stuff like that, especially these circle hooks. And once the fish hooks on, you tend to keep your fish. So these are your, what we call assist hooks. You have some that are slightly longer, you have some that are shorter. But the key here is to utilize a solid metal ring for the point of attachment rather than a split ring, which is more likely to bend open. You can tie your leader to the solid ring, ensuring that the load or the force of the fish biting onto the hook is transferred to the leader rather than onto the lure. Then you can use a split ring to attach your jig to the system. And to this split ring, that's where you attach all your different jigs of any size you want. You can get the bigger ones too. size of hook is way your size for this type of jig, but that's your basic setup. And if you have a slightly smaller hook, it will be located about there, about mid jig. That's one way of setting it up. The other way of setting it up is on how most jigs, when you buy them in the store. According to Robbie, he sees jigs most often being sold with triple hooks simply being attached by split rings and leaders being attached by split rings, which can result in more jigs being lost and therefore more jigs having to be bought. You tie the end of your jig with its leader. The easiest way that I, I do it is I, I put my thumb through, my finger there, and I twist it so it comes over and then you just twist the end and run the, the hoop back to the, the twist you just made. It doesn't slip. Uh, it's extremely strong and it's very quick to make. You can make a bowline, you can make uh, there's tons of knots. There's the Rapala knot, which is very good. Uh, some color schemes you can do pretty simply with a bit of tape and uh, yeah. <laughs> very simple color scheme red, black, orange, pink. Time to test out some of that homemade fishing gear. There isn't much space here in the canal, but Ravi demonstrates that the new jigs fly and swim nicely, although generally triple hooks catch more on weeds and scum and can tangle themselves more easily. Robbie's always trying to hitch a ride on local fishing boats to go out with friends and to bring us back some lunch. Yeah. 
But even with all the right fishing equipment, it is no small task to catch a fish among all this sargasso weed. Non è possibile. Questo è fatto un disastro questa. Robbie's friends and the locals see that he is enthusiastic about dropping a line in the water, and they get him to drive or take care of the boat while they are out in the water spearfishing or filming, for example. There are yearly fishing tournaments here along the Riviera Maya and at Cozumel Island. Robbie took part in one recently with his fishing gang of friends. However, not one fish was caught that day, and no record-breaking fish caught by any of the boats that day. This is my hora de confesión. I have to admit that in the lancha, we are too much. The sandwiches are not going to give, so I vote for expulsar a Leo, who is the one who eats. The bitácora del capitán. And then, lightning struck our friend's boat and lit it on fire. Here, a neighbor caught Robbie trying to put it out before even the fire department arrived. <laughs> 